but we faced tougher problems and the American miracle, the American magic has always prevailed and it will do so again. And I would, I would like to take you through a little history uh, to essentially make my case that if you were to pick one time to be born and one place to be born and you didn't know what your sex was going to be, you didn't know what your intelligence would be, you didn't know what your special talents or special deficiencies would be, that if you could do that one time, you would not pick 1720, you would not pick 1820, you would not pick 1920. You'd pick, to, you'd pick today and you would pick America. And of course the interesting thing about it is that ever since America was organized, in 1789, um, when George Washington took the oath of office, uh, people have wanted to come here. I mean, can you imagine that? You know, for, for 231 years, uh, there's always been people that have wanted to come here. Now, uh, my friend, uh, uh, I think has jumped the gun just a shade on putting up slide one, but I'm going to call from some slides as we go along. But the interesting thing about this country is what is on slide one. Let's put it up. And, and uh, uh, this is an extraordinarily young country. Now, I'm comparing it to a couple of guys that are pretty old, but, <laughs> but when you think about the fact that my age... Charlie's age or our life experience and then we'll throw in this young guy over here <laughs> Greg Abel and if our life experiences combined exceed the life of the United States we are a very very young country but what we've accomplished is miraculous now just think of this this little spot in history and and if we'll go to slide two, uh, I've tried to estimate, uh, well, let's go back and not, not, we're, we're, we'll stay with slide two, but the population in 1790, you know, we had 3.9 million people here. Uh, and suddenly when you look up census figures, you find out that the they had a big fire in the Department of Commerce building in 1921, so they lost a lot of the census <laughs> records. So these are not quite as, uh, there's, there's some things where there's a few gaps, but there were 3.9 million people in the United States. And actually, uh, I've got 0.6 million, it's closer to 0.7 million. There were 700,000 of those people were slaves at the time. But those 3.9 million people were one half of 1% of the population of the planet. Uh, and if you'd asked any of those 3.9 million people, any of them, to imagine what life would be like 231 years later, even the most optimistic person and let them, they could have uh, been drinking heavily and even had a little pot of them. And they still could not in their wildest dreams have thought that in three lifetimes, Charlie's, mine, and Greg's, that in that period, you would be looking at a country with 280 million vehicles shuffling around its roads, airplanes, Maybe not today so much, but they'll be back again. And they were flying people at 40,000 feet, coast to coast in five hours, that great universities would exist in one state after another, and great hospital systems, and entertainment would be delivered to people in a way nobody could have dreamt of uh, in 1790s. This, this country, in 231 years, has exceeded anybody's dreams. It, uh, 
Uh, I went to the um, internet and trying to prepare for this, and uh, I uh, tried, if you'll move to the next slide, I tried to uh, uh, find out what was the wealth of the country in 1789, our starting point. And I uh, punched in United States wealth. I tried 1789, I tried 1790. I thought it might be a little easier for the, in terms of a round year. And uh, I think four million or so references came up. And I didn't look at all four million. But I can tell you, the data collection in uh, those early days on many, on many fronts uh, was not anything like today. Uh, uh, you really can't, uh, you can't find what I would consider uh, reliable figures. You can, you can find out how many mules there were in the country and a few things like that and add, trying to add them up. But, uh, but in real estate, uh, you know, when you find them, when you're looking at houses or apartment houses or office buildings that, uh, you know, they're, they're each slightly different than each other, but, uh, but they look to comparable sales. So uh, uh, it's hard to find a lot of countries that have been sold uh, uh, where the wealth has been uh, uh, estimated. But it was interesting to go back and think about the fact that in 1803, we purchased for $15 million. Uh, we made the Louisiana purchase. Now, that's a little later than 1789. But, but that's, the, that's the best comp, as they say in real estate. That's the best comp I, we could find for land mass anyway. And uh, when we purchased, uh, made that purchase, that was equal incidentally to about a quarter, about 800,000 plus square miles, but it was about a quarter of what the lower 48 states now contain. So we bought about a quarter of the lower 48 for this $15 million back in 1803. And um, if, you, if you live in Texas uh, and your grandfather uh, is close to dying, and he calls. He calls the um, grand grandchildren, children around him, and in his final words, he always says, "Don't sell the mineral rights." Well, the French sold us the mineral rights on that fifteen million dollar deal as well. So we we got uh, that whole. Strip there, we got all of Kansas and essentially all of Oklahoma, and they produced 21 billion barrels of oil for us and a lot of natural gas uh, since the purchase. Uh, one of the sidelights is that uh, we paid our 15 million for the Louisiana purchase. We paid 3 million of it, 20% of it. We paid with a with 200,000 ounces of gold, valued at 15 bucks an ounce. And uh, that three million that the French took. And uh, we got South Dakota as part of the uh, Louisiana Purchase and the home state mine up there, uh, before it closed, produced well over 40 million ounces of gold. And uh, 40 million ounces of gold. and uh, comes to about $60 billion worth. Uh, and uh, uh, like I say, we 200,000 ounces took care of 20% 20, uh, 20 of our purchase price. So the Louisiana purchase was a bargain, but it's what the going price was for 800,000 square miles, I guess, at the time. And uh, three cents an acre. And so I decided by playing around with various numbers such as that, that it as a, as a reasonable estimate of the worth of the country uh, in 1789, 
a billion was not a crazy figure. Now, if I'd been an academician or something, I would have put a billion, one hundred and seven million, four hundred thousand, or something like that. Or I, it's, uh, I would have made it look respectable. But it's a wild guess. But it's not. Uh, uh, it's not a crazy figure. So what has happened? Uh, let's move on to the next slide. To the wealth of the country since then. And here we have some figures that come out pretty regularly. Well, they do come out regularly. Where the Federal Reserve uh, estimates the net household worth of people in the United States, all the, all the households in the United States. And you can look these up and you'll, you'll see that you know, there's 30 trillion of stocks and, and uh, I think maybe single family homes, whatever, there's 82 million or so owner occupied single families and maybe 45 million rental apartments and so on. So you start adding all these up and uh, the Federal Reserve tells us, and I invite you to look at the the that it's kind of interesting that we now in the United States, 231 years later, we have 100 trillion. We have more than 100 trillion of household wealth, even though the stock market's gone down somewhat uh, uh, since the last quarterly report. Uh, so you say, well, uh, you know, we've had a lot of inflation and everything. Uh, we actually in the United States. For the first half of our existence, roughly, we didn't really have that much inflation. Uh, we, we had inflationary periods and deflationary periods, but the general price level did not change that dramatically. But I will assume again for this calculation that that uh, uh, there's been 20 for one inflation. It's it's way less than that in many commodities, but but it's, it, and it's very hard to. Uh, to measure and uh, talk about equivalent uh, benefits from different kinds of products and so on and costs. But I, I think it's reasonable to say that the United States in real terms uh, has increased in wealth. That's something in the area of 5,000 for one, which is really, it's mind blowing. 5,000 for one in real terms in a country that had a half a percent of the, and a bunch of raw land. Uh, but a vision uh, that uh, to accomplish that in 231 years, uh, uh, there's just no denying that, that, that that's beyond, beyond what anybody could have dreamt earlier. But it was not done, and this is important, because we've now hit a bump in the road. It was not done without some very, very serious bumps in the road. It was not 231 years of steady progress. And matter of fact, uh, we had been in um, the, uh, in this birth of this country, we'd been what, into it 72 years. And if we go to the next slide, in uh, 1861, we now had about 31 million people. With the 1960 census showed around 31 million people or thereabouts uh, in the country, and 4 million of them were slaves, and we had never really resolved the very much unfinished business of what was involved in, in compromises in 1789, and we'll have more to say about that later. But uh, we had something that, that uh, not too many countries experienced, and if you told people in 1789 that in, 17, in 72 years you were going to have a division that caused the president of the United States at Gettysburg to to say that uh, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and dedicated can long endure. 
Imagine the President of the United States wondering aloud whether the country that he was presiding over could long endure only 72 years or 74 years at Gettysburg uh, uh, had taken place. So while this marvelous dream was being played out, uh, roughly a third of the way through it, we faced this, this really moment of decision and we, we entered into a contest that, uh, uh, if we'll go to the next slide, we made an estimate, then literally killed roughly 6% of the males in the country who were between 18 and 60. Uh, I'm assuming that there were more than 600. Uh, thousand deaths in the war and uh, I think it's a reasonable estimate that that uh, that 18 to 60 group was uh, males were by far the great proportion so imagine six percent of your working prime age uh, males in a country are wiped out in four years. So when we look at the progress of this country and we think of our own problems now, uh, I just uh, ask you to ponder and we'll move to the next slide. That would be equivalent today to having four billion males in that same age group similarly wiped out. Uh, uh, so that was one incredible interruption which this country nevertheless uh, worked through while compiling this American dream that is uh, one of the wonders of the world, perhaps the wonder of the world in many senses. So uh, let's move on to the another crisis of a different sort that hit the country. And this, of course, is the 1929 crash, which led to the Great Depression. And um, here, um, the Dow Jones average, which we'll use through this at that time, that's the one everybody paid attention to. Actually, the second most important average at that time, if you look at the papers, was the New York Times average, which has disappeared. And, of course, the Standard & Poor's has uh, probably regarded as a superior uh, yardstick. But the Dow Jones is a perfectly adequate yardstick. And on September 3rd, 1929, the Dow Jones average closed at... 381.17, and people were very happy and buying stocks on margin had worked wonderfully in the Roaring Twenties. Had a good feeling to it with the auto coming of age and the day of air travel coming along and all kinds of new appliances and the telephone getting wider use, believe it or not, that uh, hadn't really uh, caught on that much. Uh, uh, prior there too, but the movies were coming on. The, the, it was a happy place. And then of course, if we'll move to the next slide, we'll look at what happened in the couple of months after September 3rd. And the Dow Jones average uh, almost got cut in half. And that was pretty impressive until we had this recent situation where in, in a shorter period of time, we lost about a third. But the, the um, uh, the crash, uh, and there's a great book about it called The Great Crash by John Kenneth Galbraith. Uh, let me interject one little plug here. Uh, there's a, uh, a small business in Oman. I, I hate what this, what truncating this meeting or changing it so dramatically has done to many of the businesses in Oman because I think small businesses beneficial were the beneficiaries of of a really um, 
uh, they got a lot of business for the Berkshire meeting and they're going to get it in the future. But, but they suffered during a period like this. And they just had a story about the bookworm. Well, the bookworm, if you buy any books that come out of the, anything I recommend, uh, think about just putting bookworm, bookworm in Omaha and, and, uh, uh, the Great Crash is a wonderful book, and John kind of Galbraith describes it. Um, but I would like to get into a, a bit of a personal note, uh, which will have some relevance, not too much, but some relevance, uh, to the, uh, the story of the Great Depression. Because uh, uh, in 1929, my dad, who was 26 years of age then, uh, was employed as a security salesman by a a local small bank, and uh, he sold stocks and bonds, but he mostly he sold stocks. And when stocks fall 48 percent, and you were selling them to people a few months ago, uh, you really don't feel like going out and facing those same people. So I think my dad. Uh, Probably, I like to do as they say now, shelter in place, which means stay at home. And uh, uh, there really wasn't that much in our house. Uh, we, we just had a small yard. It was winter time anyway. My dad wouldn't have been puttering around the yard anyway. And there really wasn't, you know, the television wasn't there. And, and, uh, 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 and he and my mother got along very well. So. Under those conditions, uh, if you'll turn to the next slide, uh, I was uh, born about nine months later. So, at, uh, but at that time, uh, I was actually born on August 30th, but the stock market was closed that day, and so I'm using the previous day figures. But the it wasn't uh, I didn't notice at the time that the market was closed, but the stock market had actually recovered. Over 20% during that nine and a half month period or thereabouts, uh, people did not think in the fall of 1930, they did not think they were in the Great, uh, a Great Depression. They thought it was a recession very much like had occurred at least a dozen times, although not always when stock markets were important. But that, we'd had many recessions in the uh, in the United States over the time, and this did not look like it was something dramatically out of the or ordinary. Uh, uh, but, and for a while, actually for about 10 days after my birth, uh, that view held on, and uh, uh, the stock market actually managed to go up all of 1 or 2% there. That, uh, in those 10 days. But that's the last day. Uh, well, from that point, if you'll turn to the next slide, the uh, stock market went from a level of 240 to 241, which was a noticeable decline because uh, if somebody had given me $1,000 on the day I was born and I'd bought stocks with it and bought the Dow average, my $1,000 would have become uh, $170 in, in less than two years. And that is something that none of us ever, ever experienced. That uh, uh, We may have had it with one stock occasionally, but, but in terms of uh, having a broad range of America marked down 83% in two years and marked down 89% of the peak that was in September 3rd, 1929, uh, was extraordinary. And um, in that intervening period, less than one year after I was born, just slightly less than one year, my dad went to the bank where he worked and had his account. And of course, the bank had a sign on it closed. And uh, so he had no job. And uh, he had two kids at that point. And uh, his father had a grocery store, but uh, 
Charlie and I both worked for my grandfather. Charlie worked there in 1940. I worked there in 1941, so we didn't know each other. But, but my grandfather said to my father that, uh, don't worry about your groceries. Howard, he says, I'll just let your bill run. <laughs> that was, my grandfather was not exactly. Uh, he, he, was, he cared about his family, but he wasn't going to go crazy. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the things, as I look back on that period... As I, and I don't think the economists generally like to give it that much of a point of importance, but, but if we'd had the FDIC 10 years earlier, we, the FDIC started on January 1st, 1934. It was part of the sweeping legislation that took place when Roosevelt came in. But if we'd had the FDIC, uh, we would have had a much, much different experience, I believe, in the in the Great Depression. People blame it on smooth, smooth haul here, and they, I mean, they, they, uh, there's all kinds of things, and, and the margin requirements in '29, and all of those things entered into creating a recession. But if you have over 4,000 banks fail, that's 4,000 local experiences where people save and save and save and put their money away and then someday they reach for it and it's gone. Uh, and that happens, you know, in all 48 states and it happens to your neighbors and it happens to your relatives. Uh, it, it has to have an effect on the psyche that's incredible. So it, uh, one very, very, very good thing that came out of the Depression, in my view, uh, is the FDIC. And uh, uh, it would have been a somewhat different world, I'm sure, if the bank failures hadn't just rolled across this country and, and, uh, and uh, with people that thought that they were savers found out that they had nothing uh, when they went there and there was a sign that said closed. Uh, incidentally, the FDIC, uh, I think very few people know this, but uh, or at least they don't appreciate it, but the FDIC has not cost the American taxpayer a dime. I mean, it's expenses, inks, backed by the federal government and associated with the federal government. But now it holds $100 billion, and that consists of premiums that were paid in and investment income on the premiums, less the expenses and paying of all the losses. And think of the incredible amount of peace of mind that's, got, that's given to people that were not uh, uh, similarly uh, uh, situated in, in when the Great Depression hit. So the Great Depression went on, and um, it lasted a very long time, but it, it lasted a lot longer in the minds of people than it did actually in its effects. World War II came along, and on sort of an involuntary manner, we adopted Keynesianism. We started running fiscal deficits, of course, that were absolutely huge and took our debt up to a percentage of GDP, which we've never reached, had never reached before, uh, and never have reached since. Uh, so we had an enormous economic recovery, but the minds of people had been so scarred, the memories. Parents told their children, 1929 became a symbol in people's minds. I mean, if you said 1929, it was like saying 1776 or 1492. I mean, everybody knew exactly what you were talking about. And it affected stock prices in a rather remarkable way to the point, if you'll change to the next slide, it was January 4th of 1951 
that the kid who was born on August 30th in 1930 had finished college before the stock market got back to where it was uh, at that earlier time. So take the years from 1920, 1930, or 1929, really, to 1951, or take the year from my birth, 20 years, and bear in mind that uh, you know the country was only 140 years old when this started. That that's 20 years out of a, this amazing 231-year lifetime of our country that uh, was flat out, you know, a time of for a long time of no economic growth and no feeling by people in terms about the wealth of the country, the, about what American economy was worth, what all these corporations that were doing far, far, far better than they were long ago. But it took all of that time to restore uh, in the market a price level uh, that was equal to uh, what it was when I was born 20 years earlier. So uh, if you think about the fact that we're enduring a few months and we'll endure some many more months, but uh, and we don't know how it comes out. And people in the 30s didn't know how it was going to come out, but they endured, persevered, prospered, and uh, uh, the American miracle uh, continued. But it's interesting in that uh, I actually don't have a slide for the next one because last night I was thinking after all the slides had been prepared, I was actually thinking about this a little later, a little bit, and I remembered that uh, um, in 19, at the start of 1954, the stock market was, the Dow was only at about 280. Uh, and I remember 1954 because it was the best year I ever had in the stock market. And uh, uh, the Dow went from essentially uh, uh, what, two, 280 or thereabouts at the start of the year to a little over 400 at the end of the year. And when it went to 400, as soon as it went across 381, that famous figure from 1929, when it went to 400, uh, this will be hard for some of you to believe, but everybody wondered, is this 1929 all over again? And that seems a little far-fetched because it was a different country in 1954. But that was the common question, and it actually achieved, uh, it, 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 it was, you know, it, it achieved such uh, a level of worry about whether we were about to jump off another cliff just because the 381 of 1929 had been succeeded, <clears throat> exceeded, that they held Senator Fulbright, Bill Fulbright of Arkansas, who became very famous later in terms of the Foreign Relations Committee, but he headed the Senate Banking Committee. And he called a special, uh, for a special investigation, and he called it the uh, what do you call it? The stock market study. But it really, as you, if you read through it, he really was questioning whether we had built another house of cards again. And on his committee, it's interesting to see the Senate Finance Committee, uh, one of the members was uh, Prescott Bush, the, uh, the father of George H.W. Bush and grandfather of George W. Bush, uh, uh, and had some illustrious names. And his committee... In March of 1955, with the Dow at 405, assembled 20 of the best minds in the United States to testify as to whether we were going crazy again because the market was at 400, the Dow was at 400, and we'd gotten in this incredible trouble before. But that was the mindset of the country. It's incredible. Uh, we didn't really believe... America was 
what it was. And my boss, the reason I'm familiar with this thousand page book that I have here, I found it last night uh, in the library, and everything, uh, was that I was working in New York for one of the 20 people that was called down to testify before Senator Fulbright. And he testified right before Bill Martin, who was running the Federal Reserve, testified, and right after General Wood, who was running Sears, uh, testified. Sears was very, very important then. And, and Bill Martin, of course, is the fellow that the longest running chairman in the history of the Fed, and he's the one that gave the famous quote about the function of the Fed was to take away the punch balls just when uh, the party started to get really warmed up. Uh, but Ben Graham, my boss, sent me over to the public library in New York and to gather some information for him, something he could do in five minutes with a computer now, and I dug out something, and he went to testify. And uh, on page 545 of this book, I knew where to look. I didn't have to go through it all, but he uh, had a, the quote, which I remember, and I remember because Ben Graham was the one of the three smartest people I've met in my life, and he was the dean of people in securities business. He wrote the classic security analysis book in 1934. He wrote the book that changed my life, The Tillage Investor, in 1949. He was unbelievably smart. And when he testified with the Dow at 404, he had one line in there right toward the start in, in his written testimony, and he said, the stock market is high, it looks high, it is high, but it's not as high as it looks. But he said, it is high. And since that time, if we'll turn to the next slide, of course, we felt the American tailwind at full force, and, and the Dow, well, let's see, we, uh, yeah, when the Dow was, went down Friday, but, it, but when we made the slide, it was about 24,000. So uh, you're looking at a market today that has produced $100 for every dollar. All you did had, was had to believe in America, just buy a cross-section of America. You didn't, you didn't have to read the Wall Street Journal. You didn't have to look up the price of your stock. You didn't have to pay a lot of money in fees to anybody. You just had to believe that the American miracle was intact. But you'd had this testing period between 1929 and, and uh, well, really, uh, certainly 1954 is indicated by what happened when it got back up to 380. You had this testing period, and uh, uh, people really they'd lost faith to some degree. They just didn't see the potential of what America could do. And we found that, uh, that uh, nothing can stop America when you get right down to it. And uh, it's been true all along. It may have been interrupted uh, with the scariest of scenarios when you had a war with one group of states fighting another group of states. And it may have been tested again in the Great Depression, and it may be tested now to some degree. But in the end, the answer is never bet against America. And uh, uh, that, in my view, is as true today as it was in 1789, and even was true at the during the Civil War and the depths of the Depression. Now, I'm now about to say something that, that uh, and don't change the slide yet, but uh, I'm now about to say something that some of you will be tempted to argue with me about, but I would make the case that we are imperfect in a great, great, great many ways, but I would say, and if you'll put up the next slide, that we are now a better country as well as an incredibly more wealthy country than we were in 1789. We're far, far, far from what we should be, will be, 
but we have gone dramatically in the right direction. Uh, it's interesting. We said in 1776, we said we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, endowed by their art, endowed by their creative and certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Uh, and yet, 14 years later, a year after we, we be, really officially began the country in 1789, adopted a constitution, uh, we found that more than 15% of the people in the country were slaves. And we wrestled with that, but when you say the word self-evident, that sort of sounds like you're saying any damn fool can recognize that. And you certainly say, uh, you can argue maybe a little bit about life and the pursuit of happiness, but I don't see how in the world anybody can reconcile liberty with the idea that that 15% of the population was enslaved. And it took us a long time to at least partially correct that. The economy took a civil war. It took, it took losing 6% of those people that uh, the males that were between 18 and 60 years of age uh, took, but we've moved in the right direction. We've got a long ways to go, but we've moved in the right direction now. In addition, going back again to that 1776 statement that all men are created equal and uh, endowed by their creator, etc. Uh, I think it was self-evident to the 50% uh, of the population that uh, they were getting a fair deal for over half the lifetime of the country. It took 131 years of our country's 231 years. It took 131 years until women were guaranteed the right to vote for our country's leaders. And then what's even more remarkable is that after we adopted the 19th Amendment in 1920, it took 61 more years until a woman was allowed to join those eight males on the Supreme Court. I grew up thinking that the Supreme Court, you know, must have been someone that said it had to be nine men. But it, it, uh, at 61 years, so it took 192 years before Sandra Day O'Connor was appointed to the court. And now you can say that, that, there was a pipeline problem. You know, half the population may have been women in 1920, but they weren't half the lawyers, or they weren't 10% of the lawyers probably. So you can understand uh, some delay, but uh, 61 years is a long time to go and to pick 33 males in between. If that was entirely by chance, then the odds against that we were flipping coins is about eight billion to one. Now, like I said, there was a pipeline problem, but uh, uh, it took us a long, long time, and it's not done yet. But I think it does give meaning to the fact that we are a better society with a lot of room to go. But we are a better society than existed. Uh, in 1789, we, you know, when you go to Colonial Williamsburg, uh, you know, you have that. I've been there a couple of times. As a matter of fact, I, I watched the uh, uh, the debate between uh, Jimmy Carter and uh, Gerald Ford there in uh, 1976, uh, and uh, uh, you know, it it was not a great time 
to be black. It was not a great time to be a woman. And uh, both of those categories still have certainly got potential for significant improvement in terms of, of fulfilling that pledge made in 1776 about how we believe that, that it's self-evident that uh, all men are created equal. But we have made progress. We are a better society, and we will, as the years go by, uh, if you'll move to the next slide, and uh, uh, I, I believe that, and I think, let's see if I can get these slides in the proper order here. Uh, I believe that when you get through evaluating all of the qualitative facts, what we have done toward meeting the aspirations of what we wrote in 1776. What was, we wrote in 1776 wasn't a fact, but it was an aspirational document, and, and we have worked toward those aspirations, and uh, we have a long way to go, but uh, I'll repeat, if you'll move to the next slide, that never, never bet against America. Now, let's move on now to uh, a broad, much broader subject, what I don't know. And I don't know, and perhaps with a bias, I don't believe anybody knows what the market is going to do tomorrow, next week, next month, next year. I know America's going to move forward over time, but I don't know for sure. And we learned this on September 10th, 2001, and, and we learned it a few months ago in terms of the virus. Anything can happen in terms of markets. And if you... You can bet on America, but you got to have to be careful about how you bet uh, because uh, simply because markets can do anything on October, whatever it was in 1987, October 11th, I believe, Monday, the you know, markets went down 22% in one day. In 1914, they closed the stock market for about four months. After 9-11, closed the market for four days. We hustled to get it going again. But nobody knows what's going to happen tomorrow. So when you, when you bet, a, I tell you to bet on America, and I tell you that that's what's really gotten me through ever since I was, bought my first stock when I was 11. I mean, that's, that, I, I caught a, Huge, huge, huge tailwind in America, but it didn't wasn't going to blow in my direction every single day. And you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And uh, I would like to, in the context of the present news, point out something you may find kind of interesting. Uh, uh, if you go to YouTube, uh, you'll find on June 17th of 2015, four plus years ago, you'll find Sam Nunn, who's one of the people I admire the most in the United States, in the world, enormous patriot, and tremendous senator, and uh, he's carried on thankless work. Uh, since leaving the Senate, and I'd say heading something called the Nuclear Th Threat Initiative, which most of you haven't heard of, but I've but, uh, been slightly involved in it. Sam Nunn founded that. And the Nuclear Threat Initiative simply organizations that are devoted to trying to reduce the chances of, of something of a 
nuclear, chemical, biological, and now cyber nature from either malevolent or accidental or whatever it may be from uh, causing deaths to millions of Americans and, and uh, uh, among the things that Sam co-founded it and uh, uh, but he's been the heart and soul of the organization uh, subsequently and and these talked about worried about pandemics among along with the nuclear threat for decades and he's participated in war games where they play out various scenario, scenario, scenarios including malevolent, malevolent pandemics that could be started by the same kind of nut that sent the anthrax letters in uh, around uh, 9-11, a little after. Uh, and Sam appeared on this YouTube uh, presentation, and I'm sure he's been on many others. I just happened to look this one up and uh, uh, talked about the dangers of a pandemic, and anybody should listen to Sam on any time he talks. So I... Uh, he said at that time, germs, germs don't have borders, which we've certainly learned in the last couple of months. And I, uh, when I clicked on YouTube, if you'll go to the next, uh, I found out that it had recently, it had 831 views. And this, this was only a few days ago I looked it up. And uh, maybe, I don't know whether most of those views have just been the last few days, because or the last few months, I should say, because of the interest in pandemics. But uh, it is hard to think about things <clears throat> that haven't happened yet. And uh, uh, <clears throat> so we can experience, you know, when, when, when uh, something like the current pandemic happens, uh, uh, it's just, it's hard to factor that in. And that's why you never want to use borrowed money, and at least in my view, by, in margin to buy into investments. Uh, uh, and we run Berkshire that way. We run it so that we literally try to think of the worst case of not only just one thing going wrong, but other things going wrong at the same time, maybe partly caused by the first, but maybe independent even of the first. And, uh, you know, that you learned in, in, I don't know what grade now, probably earlier than when I went to school, but fifth or sixth grade that anything you can have any series of numbers times zero and just need one zero in there and the answer is zero and and uh, there's no reason to use borrowed money to participate in the American tailwind but there's every other reason to participate now I can't resist pointing out that in October of 2019 a large 300 page, I've got it right here. A uh, book was brought out, and Johns Hopkins, one of the most respected institutions in the country, uh, the Nuclear Threat Initiative, NTI, and the intelligence group at The Economist collaborated to evaluate the problems of the worldwide preparedness for pandemics, essentially. And I think in November, uh, Sam came out to see me with uh, Ernie Maurice, former Secretary of Energy, who now is the CEO of the of NTI. He and Sam are co-chairman. And Beth Cameron, who did a lot of work on this report, came out to see me. And they gave me in November, I believe, of last year. They gave me this appraisal. And the opening line, if you'll turn the page, this is the opening line of this 300-page tome. Biological threats, natural, intentional, or accidental, in any country, can pose risk to global health, international security, <clears throat> and the worldwide economy. 
And this book was prepared in order to evaluate the preparedness of the various countries and rank them. We ranked pretty well, but all of us got a failing, all of the countries got a failing grade, basically. Now, you would think with the prestige of Johns Hopkins and The Economist, along with people like Sam and Ernie, et cetera, that this would have gotten some attention. And again, uh, Sam, we'll turn to the next page, Sam and the others went on YouTube on October 24th, 2019, and they have racked up as of a couple of days ago, 1,498 views. Now, my friend Bill Gates was delivering the same warning uh, at a TED talk some years back, and he's gotten a lot more views, but it just says something about the fact that you're going to get bolts from the blue, and you can read papers about them, and you can, you can talk about what will happen if some, as they used to, the fellows at Sigma, Solomon used to tell me, some 25 Sigma event comes along, and they, you know, they say this, that that'll happen once in the, the life of the universe, you know, and then it happens to them a couple of times in a month and they go broke. It, it, uh, you just don't know what's going to happen. You know, at least in my view, you know that America's tailwind is not exhausted. You're going to get a fine result if you own equities over a long period of time. And the idea that equities will not produce better results than the 30-year Treasury bond, which yields one and a quarter percent now, it's taxable income. Uh, it's the aim of the Federal Reserve to have 2% a year inflation. Uh, uh, equities are going to outperform that bond. They're going to outperform Treasury bills. They're, out, they're going to outperform that money you've stuck under your mattress. I mean, there's, there's, they are a, a enormously sound investment as long as they're an investment and they're not a gambling device or something that uh, you think uh, you can safely you know, buy on margin or whatever it may be. Uh, it's interesting that Stocks offer, which, and stocks are a, we always look at stocks as just being a part of a business. I mean, stocks are a small part of a business. If in 1789, you'd saved a small amount of money and it wasn't easy to save, you might have bought, with those savings, you might have bought a tiny, tiny plot of property Maybe you bought an, a house that could be rented to somebody, but uh, uh, you didn't really have the chance to buy in with 10 different people who were developing businesses and who were putting, presumably putting their own money in and that would have the American tailwind behind. And, and of the 10, a reasonably high percentage would succeed in a way and earn decent returns. But, but those are the choices you might have had to do with savings. Uh, and they started offering bonds originally, and there again you got a limited return, but the return may have been, in those days, may have been 5 or 6% or something of the sort. But you can't, you can't buy risk-free bonds. I mean, the, the yardstick for me is always the, the U.S. Treasury. And, and when somebody offers you quite a bit more than the U.S. Treasury, there's usually a reason. There's, there's more risk. But going back to stocks, people bring the attitude to them too often that because they are liquid and quoted minute by minute, that it's an important that you develop an opinion on them minute by minute. Now, that's really foolish when you think about it. it uh, and that's something Graham taught me in 1949. I mean, that single thought, stocks were parts of businesses and not just little things that moved around on charts or 
charts were very popular in those days and whatever it may be. Imagine for a moment that you decided to invest money now and you bought a farm and the farmland around here. Uh, let's say you bought 160 acres and you bought it at X per share or per acre and the farmer next to you had 160 identical acres, same contour, you know, same, same quality of soil quality. So it was, it was identical. And that farmer next door to you uh, was a very peculiar character because every day that farmer with the identical farm said, I'll sell you my farm or I'll buy your farm at a certain price, which he would name. Now, that's a very obliging neighbor. I mean, that's got to be a plus <laughs> to have a fellow like that with the next farm. Uh, you don't get that with farms. You get it with stocks. You, you want a 100 shares of General Motors you know, on Monday morning, somebody will buy your 100 shares or sell you another 100 shares at ex exactly the same price, and that goes on know, five days a week. Uh, uh, but just imagine if you had a farmer doing that. When you bought the farm, you looked at what the farm would produce. That was what went through your mind. You were saying to yourself, I'm paying X dollars per acre. I think I'll get so many bushels of corn or soybeans on average. Some years good, some years bad. Some years the price will be good, some years the price will be bad, etc. But you think about the potential of the farm. And now you get this idiot that uh, buys a farm next to you and and on top of that, he's sort of a manic depressive and drinks, maybe smokes a little pot. So his numbers just go all over the place. Uh, now, the only thing you have to do is to remember that this guy next door is there to serve you and not to instruct you. You bought the farm because you thought the farm was, uh, had the potential you don't really need a quote on it. Uh, you know, if you bought in with John D. Rockefeller or Andrew Carnegie, and, um, and, uh, there were never any quotes. Well, there were quotes later on, but, but basically uh, you bought into the business and that's what you're doing when you buy stocks. But you get this added advantage that you do have this neighbor who you're not obliged to listen to at all who is going to give you a price every day and he's going to have his ups and downs and maybe he'll name a selling price that he'll buy at, in which case you sell if you want to. Uh, or maybe he'll name a very low price and you'll, you'll buy his farm from him. Uh, but you don't have to. And you don't want to put yourself in a position to where, you, where you have to. So stocks have this enormous inherent advantage of people yelling out prices all the time to you. And many people turn that into a disadvantage. And of course, many people can profit in one way or another from telling, telling you that they can tell you what this farmer's gonna yell out tomorrow or next, your neighboring farmer's gonna yell out that tomorrow price change it should be, or you tell yourself that there should be this great difference. But the truth is if you owned the businesses you liked prior to the virus arriving, uh, uh, it changes prices and it changes uh, but nobody's forcing you to sell. And if you really like the business and you like the management you're in with, and the business hasn't fundamentally changed, and I'll get to that a little when I report on Berkshire, uh, which I will soon, I promise. Uh, the uh, uh, stocks have an enormous advantage, and you still can bet on America, but you can't bet unless you're willing and have an outlook uh, to independently decide that you want to own a cross-section of America, because I don't think most people are in a position to pick single stocks. Uh, uh, a few may be, but, but on balance, I think people are much better off buying a cross-section of America and just forgetting about it. If you'd done that, if I'd done that when I got out of college, 
it's all I had to do to make 100 for one, and I collect dividends on top of it, uh, which increased, would increase substantially over time. The American tailwind is marvelous. American business represents, and it's going to have interruptions, and you're not going to foresee the interruptions, and you do not want to get yourself in a position where those interruptions can, can affect you 